Well, thank you all so much for joining us for Past and Present Here Unite. We're going to enjoy a virtual lunch, lunchtime lecture from the Longfellow House, in the Washington's Headquarters National Historic Site located in Cambridge. Uh, we're going to get an introduction to uh, this uh, National Historic Site. Uh, what does a home reveal about its occupants and about our shared history? The vassal, uh, oh, I should have practiced this, Emily. Uh, the Longfellow House bears witness to the history of slavery in New England and the early free black community of Cambridge and George Washington's development as a leader. In the 19th century, it became the home of famed poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow and a hub of literary and artistic life. And more recently, the house reveals a rich history of the historic preservation movement. We're gonna learn more about this unique public resource, which will be reopening for the season in May. And this presentation is led by Long, Longfellow House Public Programs Manager, Emily Levine. So um, all uh, 200 of us or so, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Emily for joining us this afternoon. And Emily, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Well, thank you, Robert, for this invitation. I'm so glad to be here. And, and thanks to all of you for joining us. I hope everybody's got something good for lunch while we chat today. Um, loving seeing where everyone's coming from. My challenge for you is to find some connection between your town and the Longfellow House. There are so, 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 so many connections here. We're just going to scratch the surface today. So let me share my screen with you. And um, Robert, let me know if you are not seeing my presentation. Looks good. Great. All right. So um, I'm going to be offering visual descriptions for accessibility throughout the presentation today. So I will begin with myself. Um, I am a white woman in my mid-30s with short, dark hair and glasses. Um, I'm wearing a National Park Ranger uniform. My opening slide here displays the name of the presentation, Past and Present Here Unite, taken from a Henry Longfellow poem, an introduction to Longfellow House Washington's headquarters national historic site with a National Park arrowhead. Today, we will be taking a step back, and I'm hoping to really reintroduce folks to the Longfellow House, the Vassal Craigie, Craigie Longfellow House. Um, and we're really going to be focusing on three primary and very interconnected periods, the colonial period with a focus on enslavement, the revolutionary period with a focus on George Washington and freedom, and the Victorian period and beyond with a focus on Henry Wadsworth Longfellow and his family. So this is an image of the Longfellow House recently. It is an yellow 18th century Georgian mansion surrounded by green lawn and trees. And I hope that many of you have already had a chance to visit. Um, if you have, or if you're new to the house, as Robert said, we'll be reopening at the end of May. So please stop by and join us. Uh, we're reopening May 26th. So the way that we understand and talk about history directly informs the actions that we take in our present. So in all the work that we do, we aim to embrace a call from the American Association for State and Local History to build a more productive conversation about history. Um, this includes the practice of really moving away from focusing on an idea of history as a single as, uh, abstract truth to an idea of many voices and many intersecting experiences and historic places can help us to do this. So as we think about the many people who have passed through this remarkable house, I'd love for us to hold that intention of engagement with a complex web of individuals and collective realities um, and to acknowledge that as rich as our site archives are here, and we'll get into that a little bit later, there are also significant sort of archival silences here, particularly around the histories of enslaved and free Black people um, that have often been suppressed historically in the written record. So we'll try to pull out some of those. This slide shows the text of a poem by Henry Longfellow, Haunted Houses, which I'll read in a moment. The text is next to a photograph of the house's Victorian dining room with a circular center table, gold patterned wallpaper, and several oil paintings in the gold frames. So this is a reflection by Henry Longfellow, the 19th century poet himself, who lived in this house for many years about the experience of living in a historic house. Uh, by the time he moved in, it already had many decades of history within the home. 
Um, and I've just pulled out three stanzas. There are many more. I encourage you to read them all. Uh, but he wrote, all houses wherein men have lived and died are haunted houses. Through the open doors, the harmless phantoms on their errands glide with feet that make no sound upon the floors. There are more guests at table than the hosts invited. The illuminated hall is thronged with quiet, inoffensive ghosts, as silent as the pictures on the wall. We have no title deeds to house or lands. Owners and occupants of earlier dates from graves forgotten stretch their dusty hands and hold in Mortmain still their old estates. So Longfellow himself, very, very conscious of the idea of occupying a space that others still hold some claim to. So we often ask ourselves this question of whose stories should be preserved and how. This is again a photograph of the Longfellow House, a Georgian mansion with side porches and a rainbow overhead. Uh, the text says whose stories should be preserved and how. So there's a lot going on in the museum world right now and I'll, I'll get oops, deeper into the history of the house in just a moment, but um, things going on all over, they're really exciting and challenging. Big museums like the Smithsonian are actively collecting from the pandemic and ongoing social movements. Uh, some of the newest national park units aren't mansions uh, like the Longfellow House, but they include places like the Megger and Merle Evers Home National Monument, um, a, a civil rights landmark, the Stonewall National Monument, uh, a landmark in the fight for LGBTQ rights, and uh, one of the very newest, the Blackwell School National Historic Site in Texas, a site that speaks uniquely to school segregation. So, you know, there are these really widespread and significant efforts picking up steam in the greater Boston area and beyond to uncover and reckon with the history of slavery in New England. And um, I want to highlight the idea that history can help us to create and envision a more just future. So this is a rendering of the Longfellow House to show how it likely looked during the colonial period. It is a Georgian mansion with gray paint, columns, and no side porches. It was built for Major John Vassal in 1759. Vassal was heavily invested in Caribbean slavery, and he had this grand mansion built here in Cambridge along the, the Watertown Road, now called Brattle Street. Um, John Vassal and his family's financial reliance on slavery was part of a regional landscape. So slavery helped to build New England's economy. It helped to shape its cultural traditions. And in Cambridge, a uh, 1754 provincial census counted about 56 enslaved people. These people formed community and family with other enslaved people um, and were sometimes able to carve out a certain degree of movement which um, will figure into our story in a little while. On this slide are two silhouettes facing each other. One depicts an enslaved woman in the late 18th century wearing a long skirt and holding an infant in front of her. The other depicts an enslaved man shouldering a garden hoe. And these images come from a series of silhouettes commissioned recently by Mount Vernon, uh, George Washington's home and plantation based on historical descriptions. Uh, no images of the individuals enslaved here on Brattle Street are believed to exist. I would like to share their names with you. Kuba, Dinah, Malcolm, William, and three children, including James, and two small boys whose names we currently do not know. These are seven people known to have been enslaved at 105 Brattle Street in Cambridge as of 1774. And at the Longfellow House, we owe a tremendous amount to the descendant community, uh, to our partners at the Royal House and Slave Quarters Museum in Medford, an incredible resource um, and location. I highly encourage everyone to visit them. Um, also to History Cambridge, the Cambridge Black History Project, the Museum of African American History, Harvard University, the Slave Legacy History Coalition. So, so much energy resource work, uh, research and, and work going on here. Um, we also have very recently kicked off a significant National Park Service study to look more into the lives of the folks named here um, and others who we may not yet be aware of. 
By the fall of 1774, large crowds of angry patriots were seen on Brattle Street, which was uh, a neighborhood of wealthy, wealthy loyalists, people who remained loyal to the King of England before, during, and after the American Revolution. The neighborhood's elite white loyalist residents, including John Vassal, the enslaver, and his family uh, fled to Boston, and eventually many of them returned to England. They left behind the people who they enslaved. And while little is currently known about Dinah, Malcolm, William, and the children, uh, the lives of Cuba and her husband, Tony, who was enslaved elsewhere on Brattle Street are better documented. And though their legal status was in flux, uh, with their enslavers gone, Cuba and Tony, who later used the surname Vassal, uh, reunited their family in freedom on a portion of their former enslavers estate. And from 1774, when their enslavers fled, until 1781, so about seven years, Cuba, Tony, and their six children uh, remained in another dwelling on this estate, uh, perhaps a, a, quote, farmhouse noted on what is today the neighboring campus of Lesley University. And during this time, they were tending about an acre of land for their own livelihood. And uh, Tony Vassal was also doing some paid work for the Commonwealth, helping to maintain other um, confiscated loyalist estates. This slide shows an iron fireplace backing found in the Longfellow House, which shows a heraldic sun symbol associated with the enslaver vassals uh, and the year 1759 when the house was built. And this sun backing will slowly fade. So a little rundown of events here. In late 1774, uh, that's when the enslaver vassals and their neighbors fled. Cuba and Tony Vassal seized their freedom and continued living here. April 1775, the shot heard around the world, armed conflict breaks out. Uh, the first battles of the American Revolution take place. By May of 1775, military companies are living in the former Vassal mansion, the, the house that is today the Longfellow House, taking up residence here. And several months later, in July of 1775, George Washington established a headquarters in the former Vassal Mansion, while Tony and Cuba Vassal and their children remained in an adjacent farmhouse. This slide shows a painting of a young-ish George Washington by Charles Wilson Peale next to the handwritten signature of Darby Vassal. So we often think about um, and actually, let me return to my previous slide for just a moment. Um, yeah, let me uh, let me share a little bit more about sort of the run up to Washington's arrival first. So um, George Washington arrives here in, in July of 1775 because he's looking to establish his first long term military headquarters of the American Revolution. Um, George Washington is the newly appointed commander in chief of the Continental Army. And so as historian Gloria, Gloria Whiting um, McCann describes it, in, a, in just a span of months, Tony and Cuba Vassal and their family found themselves living in a militarized town, quote, in a rebel colony, sharing an estate with the Patriot Army's commander in chief. So this is quite a change. Um, and in our interpretation and research of the Longfellow House, we really seek to center the humanity of those we know who were enslaved here and who seized freedom during this period. Um, while also talking honestly about the violent and racist realities of slavery. And, you know, who were Tony and Cuba Vassal as human beings? Who were the people who George Washington enslaved, who he brought with him to Cambridge headquarters as human beings? People like Washington, people like Longfellow, they, they left behind tons of written evidence that helps to shape their memory today. Um, but how might the people who were largely prevented from writing down their own stories um, want to be remembered? So, now we're going to go back to this painting of Washington side by side with Darby Vassal's signature and think about one really interesting place to start. And one sort of inroad is the story of an encounter that is reported to have taken place here in the summer of 1775 involving an act of resistance and freedom by a formerly enslaved six-year-old named Darby Vassal. He was the son of Cuba and Tony Vassal. Darby Vassal had been separated from his mother as an infant and enslaved by another family, um, uh, given away by his enslavers to be enslaved by another family. Um, 
Following the death of his enslaver, six-year-old Darby Vassal was somehow able to return to his parents and his siblings here in Cambridge um, to start living in freedom as a family. So this story that Darby Vassal told was, frankly, first recorded uh, several years after his death. Um, and there, while the sort of historical veracity of it is not confirmed. There's a real power in this story that he's reported again to have told throughout his life. And Darby Vassal lived to be 92 years old. So there's a lot of historical memory there as well. Um, in this story, six-year-old Darby Vassal uh, was outside here at Cambridge headquarters when General George Washington arrived and told him to go into the house and work. At which point, six-year-old Darby Vassal refused to work for no pay, Reportedly, Washington was very taken aback by this. So again, historical veracity of this encounter is unclear, but the narrative power of a formerly enslaved child standing up to the general here is unmistakable. And uh, in the account, Darby Vassal later described George as, quote, no gentleman. He wanted a boy to work without wages. Um, here we see a staircase with decorative balusters painted white. Um, sort of wrapping around themselves. A bust of George Washington sits on a black pedestal near the turn of the stairs. A bust of a woman sits on a table in the foreground and a tall grandfather clock stands on the landing of the stairs. Uh, a close-up of the George Washington bust will slowly fade into view. So we will return to Darby Vassal and his family um, shortly, but let's take just a few minutes to consider George Washington and, you know, think a little bit about what's the first word that comes to mind when you think of George. Um, and if you like, you can even put a few of those in the chat. Um, when Washington was here, he was just at the beginning of his trajectory towards being remembered as the father of his country. Uh, when he came here in 1775, he was just about 43 years old. Um, I see somebody really associates him with being a general, so his, uh, his military career. Here's a little bit of a closer look. And this is a, a, a bust of Washington that Henry Longfellow acquired uh, very shortly after he moved into this house again to, to memorialize that history here. This slide shows a Courier and Ives print of George Washington taking command of the Continental Army on the Cambridge Common. George Washington is on a horse under a tree flanked by officers and faced by hundreds of orderly white soldiers shouldering bayonets. So as headquarters was established on the estate here uh, where Tony and Cuba Vassal were living, it's unclear whether or not any other members of their family ever encountered George. But how did he get here? Um, he was, of course, a uh, Virginia plantation owner, an enslaver, a delegate to the Continental Congress, and a minor military figure at this point. Uh, June 1775, around the time of the Battle of Bunker Hill, Washington was appointed commander-in-chief of the Continental Army and made his way up to Boston, where the British Army was laying siege to the city. He arrived in Cambridge in early July and a couple weeks later moved into the headquarters here at 105 Brattle Street, finding it to be sort of the biggest vacantist available mansion um, in the area. The uh, Massachusetts Provincial Congress Committee of Safety began managing um, military emergency affairs in Massachusetts, and, and they were starting to prepare the former vassal home for Washington in early seven, uh, July 1775. We have um, been able to identify records of his the, the steward who they employed to sort of really oversee setting up the headquarters here, a man named Timothy Austin. And these account books reveal orders for food and furnishing and supplies. Uh, the only thing Washington directed the ordering of himself was the copious amounts of wine and spirits that were ordered to headquarters during his time here. Also, some of the highest expenditures were there. There was food, there was tableware indicating the, the fine dinners that were going on at the headquarters here. Um, several people enslaved by Washington, again, including William Lee, um, were present in the camp, and they were forced to labor alongside free paid workers, both Black and white, who Austin recorded in his account books. This slide shows a 19th century painting titled Lady Washington's Arrival, uh, depicting Martha Washington arriving at headquarters in late 1775. It's a painting by Howard Pyle. 
that shows the Vassal House uh, headquarters in its original gray paint with about two dozen people on foot and on horseback in front. Washington received a whole host of high profile visitors while he was directing military affairs here in Cambridge, including Benjamin Franklin, Aaron Burr, uh, John Adams, and Oneida Chief Skenandoa. He spent all told about nine months here in Cambridge with the British Army occupying Boston. And while he was here, he was really charged with turning the informally trained uh, New Englanders, these individual patriot militias, into united fighting force, really an army that could stand up to and match the British. Initially, Washington was not impressed. He wrote of observing the troops early on during his time here and said they were, quote, exceedingly dirty and nasty. Uh, but in his first general orders, Washington urged them to lay aside their regional differences. Uh, he was a little bit taken aback as well by their lack of military hierarchy, their, their less centrally organized structure. Um, and he, he encouraged them to uh, have, quote, one and the same spirit animate the whole. So Washington made several really interesting and important decisions while he was headquartered here. Uh, in the first, he demonstrated his ability to, um, to eventually change his decisions when he was wrong. Washington was very shocked uh, to find a racially integrated army here in Massachusetts when he arrived. Uh, and during one of his first war council meetings here at Cambridge headquarters, he, he removed black soldiers from the military. Some of the generals disagreed with him. And of course, these soldiers themselves advocated for their right to fight. Several months later, um, Washington faced a reenlistment crisis after the contracts for the Continental Army soldiers expired. Um, at that point, Washington made a pragmatic choice. He chose to reintegrate the Continental Army allowing black soldiers to fight for the cause. And this led to um, one of the most integrated um, periods of the US Army until later in the 20th century. Um, historians have debated the extent to which this reflects a shifting of Washington's views versus a pragmatic decision um, by, by Washington. Um, there were certainly strong aspects of pragmatism that we can see in that. Um, and there's been a lot of really wonderful work done by our colleagues at Boston National Historical Park and Minuteman National Historical Park and Boston African American National Historic Site to track um, uh, patriots of color, um, both black and indigenous men who fought in the American Revolutionary War. Um, and there's a, there's a tremendous amount of rich information they have on their service and their lives online. So I encourage folks to check that out as well. On this slide um, there is a, a painting of George Washington wearing military attire and standing next to a large white war horse. Uh, this painting is by Gilbert Stuart. And um, I was just looking at the chat briefly. Um, someone had noticed a couple of things in the chat, uh, someone citing George Washington as a leader, a patriot, a first president, and a, a, a great observation that the people on horseback um, look black in the painting of Martha Washington arriving. Um, that's correct. If you get a closer look at it, um, that's that is the case. And you can look up that that portrait and learn more. It's a, a pretty fascinating depiction. So George Washington ultimately oversaw the evacuation of British troops from Boston. Um, March of 1776, the War Council moved to challenge the British. Um, uh, several months prior, with uh, the assistance of Henry Knox. Washington had sort of approved Knox's mission to head out with a, a force to Fort Ticonderoga and transport um, a number of cannon all the way back to Boston and to fortify a strategic location at Dorchester Heights. So March of 1776, they completed that, that uh, fortification of the Heights in the middle of the night. Um, and from that location, the Continental Army suddenly had a key strategic advantage, threatened the shipping lanes in the Boston Harbor, which were a critical means of both supply and escape for the British fleet that was stationed there. Um, and so Washington created this opportunity to negotiate with the British Army. Um, they made an agreement where the British would leave Boston without burning the city down. Um, and as a result, they would not be bombarded by the cannon as they sailed away. The day they sailed away, of course, March 17th, 76, 1776, um, still celebrated in the city of Boston as evacuation day. So, you know, today as we think about Washington's national hero status, his public memory, 
can feel more complicated, right? Elitism and racist ideas did characterize some of his decisions as a general, um, including those here at headquarters. So how and why does his memory still loom so large? People are citing his contributions, again, as the first president, as a leader. And there's some key myth-making that goes on um, by people like Henry Longfellow in the 19th century that we'll touch on as well. So we're going to return to this in just a moment. <clears throat> but before we do, um, let's return briefly to Tony and Kuba Vassal. This slide shows an 18th century handwritten document with two pages of text signed with a bold T mark. Um, Tony and Kuba Vassal spent the next six years farming uh, this land in freedom after Washington's departure from Cambridge. Um, their freedom was somewhat tenuous, and yet they were carving out their own financial um, and sort of life stability. Tony and Kuba Vassal advocated repeatedly for financial compensation out of their former enslaver's estate. And in 1780, the Massachusetts legislature um, <clears throat> authorized the seizure of properties abandoned by loyalists like John Vassal, their ens former enslavers, and, and his family. So they were going to set the, the Commonwealth was going to sell the John Vassal estate to new private owners, and Tony and Kuba Vassal knew that they faced eviction. Um, with the help of a literate friend whose identity we do not know for certain, they then petitioned the legislature to be allowed um, the deed to a small portion of this land to stay here and cultivate it. That petition was either denied or never heard, but several months later they filed a second petition, this one that you see here, signed with uh, Tony or Anthony's T mark in the bottom um, right corner of the screen. And a little excerpt here reads, though dwelling in a land of freedom, both himself and his wife have spent almost 60 years of their lives in slavery. And that though deprived of what makes them happy, now happy beyond expression, they have ever lived a life of honesty and been faithful in their master's service. One hopes that they shall not be denied the sweets of freedom the remainder of their days by being reduced to the painful necessity of begging for bread. So a lot to unpack there. This petition invokes strategic language directed at the audience of white legislatures, legislators, um, both revolutionary freedom rhetoric um, and uh, again, this sort of conciliatory rhetoric, which again is very, very strategic um, and it's successful. So, you know, you can note that in this strategic rhetoric, they chose to omit mention, mention, uh, excuse me, mention of recovering their children from other enslavers. Um, they did not mention a freedom plot that Tony was involved with in 1752. So again, a strategic petition. Um, it was granted and Tony Vassal received 12 pounds annually from the Commonwealth out of the sale of his former enslavers in state for the rest of his life. Um, and despite the success of their petition, Tony and Kuba Vassal and other free Black Canterbridgeans carved out freedom in an environment of ongoing racial discrimination and evolving legal uncertainty. Uh, between 1780 and 1783, a new state constitution and a series of court cases signaled the legal end of slavery in Massachusetts. In 1787, Tony and Kuba Vassal purchased a home nearby in Cambridge, and they later purchased an additional five acres, living into the early uh, 19th century. Uh, shown here is a handwritten early 19th century petition with six names signed, including Darby Vassal, uh, all the way down at the very bottom of the petition. So several of the children of Tony and Kuba Vassal went on to become noted activists in the Cambridge and Boston Black communities, including their son Darby, who had stood up to George Washington when he was six years old. Darby Vassal lived to be 92. That meant that he died just several months after the outbreak of the American Civil War. Uh, he was a lifelong abolitionist and advocate for Black education. He was apparently literate. Again, here you see him signing his name to a petition submitted to the state in 1812 uh, aimed at securing funding for a public school for Black students in Boston, Boston's Beacon Hill neighborhood where Darby Vassal was living. So we're going to transition time periods a little bit to the home's next prominent resident. And um, Darby Vassal will come back to us once more at the very end of our time together. So this slide shows two different photographs of the famed 19th century poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. On the left, he is a 43-year-old uh, white man with wavy hair and sideburns wearing a dark suit, photographed in 1850. 
On the right, he is a 61-year-old man with longer white hair and a beard photographed in 1868. So these photographs are just about 18 years apart. Uh, again, the sort of Henry, the, the, the house's next prominent resident, he was very fascinated by the history of this home, particularly the Washington history. So who is Longfellow? Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, uh, when he moved into this house, was on his way to becoming one of the best known American poets of the 19th century. He had an upper middle class background, a fairly elite education, but he had broad popular appeal. We think of him as America's first professional poet, someone who was eventually able to make his living from his poetry. Uh, he first came to live here in 1837, nearly 60 years after Washington departed Cambridge headquarters. Uh, you know, think a little bit, if you live in an older house, who, who lived in your house 60 years ago? Do some digging if you don't know. Um, Longfellow was born in 1807 in Portland, Maine, then part of Massachusetts. Um, he traveled in Europe after graduating Bowdoin College um, and then taught uh, modern languages first at Bowdoin and then at Harvard University. Um, he held his position at Harvard for about 17 years, and that's what precipitated his move to Cambridge. Uh, throughout this period, he was he was publishing poetry. He published a travelogue from his, his time in Europe as well. And here we see his study uh, photographed in, in the Longfellow House today. This is a view of a study with a round center table cluttered with books and writing implements. A standing desk sits on a second round table in front of a window. The room has brown wallpaper, uh, red curtains and carpet, and an ornately carved black armchair is here in the foreground. Um, Longfellow published his first major collection of poems, Voices of the Night, in 1839, when he was about 32 years old. He also published a novel called Hyperion that same year, and really began to establish himself as one of America's leading authors. And again, it, it might be kind of hard to think about a poet today occupying the sort of prominence that Longfellow did 150 years ago. Um, he went like 19th century viral. Um, soon Americans were reading his poetry by their firesides, in schools, at public occasions. They eagerly awaited his new publications. Um, they heard musical settings of his work. And of course, they memorized and recited his poetry in schools. And, you know, Longfellow had talent, he had broad appeal, and he also had very savvy business sense and savvy publishers. Um, poems like his 1854, The Song of Hiawatha, um, and later The Courtship of Miles Standish, these were like public events, new Longfellow poems coming out. They were, they were shrewdly orchestrated to, to maximize sales. Um, here you see a pencil stub and a note in Henry Longfellow's handwriting that this is the pencil, uh, the remainder of the pencil with which Evangeline was written. And then uh, you also see here, a postcard image, Cambridge Mass, the home of Longfellow. So Longfellow became this really looming presence, um, an important symbol for Americans, representing a set of values that changed as the country did throughout the century. And, you know, Longfellow is often known for his poems being optimistic, approachable, drawing on uniquely American themes and history, even as he utilized sort of classical European poetic forms. Couple excerpts of Longfellow poems that you might recognize if you're still sort of trying to dig out of the back of your head. Wait, which 19th century poet is that? Uh, Paul Revere's Ride, 1861, published just before the start of the Civil War. That's uh, Listen, My Children, and You Shall Hear of the Midnight Ride of Paul Revere, the 18th of April in 75. Hardly a man is now alive who remembers that famous day and year. Um, you might also recognize the theologian's tale, Ships That Pass in the Night and speak each other in passing, only a signal shown and a distant voice in the darkness. So on the ocean of life we pass and speak one another, only a look and a voice, then darkness again and a silence. So Henry Longfellow certainly didn't do this alone. He married his first wife, Mary Storer Potter, a former classmate in 1831. She died very sadly in 1835 following complications of a miscarriage while traveling in Europe. Um, we see here Henry Longfellow's second wife, Frances Elizabeth Appleton Longfellow. This is a portrait of a young woman wearing a black lace scarf, leaning her cheek on her folded hands. Um, and uh, this shows Fanny when she was about 20 years old. Uh, in a moment, a handwritten letter by Fanny Longfellow will appear.
So Henry Longfellow met uh, Fanny Appleton in 1836 while they were both still traveling in Europe. She was 18 years old at the time. Her family was from Boston and uh, Longfellow briefly traveled with the Appletons. Henry was absolutely smitten. She remained aloof. They had a tumultuous seven year courtship, finally married in 1843. Uh, Fanny was from a very, very wealthy family. She was educated, she was independent, and of course had spent time um, traveling around Europe. And, and here's her handwriting, actually. This is the letter uh, in which she finally accepted Henry Longfellow's proposal of marriage. This is a group portrait of a man and a woman in profile and two small boys facing the camera. Um, and another handwritten letter with cross-written text will appear shortly. So at a, as a wedding present in 1843, Fanny's father, Nathan Appleton, bought this couple the house. Uh, Nathan was one of Massachusetts's most wealthy men. He was one of the richest men in the state. Um, he was a textile investor with business connections to Southern slavery and the cotton economy. Henry and Fanny raised six children, five of whom lived to adulthood here in what they called Craigie House uh, and lived among friends and family in comfort happiness and, and quite a bit of privilege. The household was sustained by a number of servants and domestic workers, largely of Irish origin. Uh, and Fanny kept journals and diaries and letters uh, to friends and family, including this one, many of which remain in our extensive archival collections at the house today. Uh, Fanny was witty, she was biting, she was very observant. And um, once her first child was born, she stopped journaling and really put herself full time into motherhood, but she still wrote a tremendous amount of correspondence. Um, she was bold and outspoken at times. Henry referred to her as, quote, a woman of genius. Um, and in 1847, she became the first documented American to use anesthesia in childbirth um, in the form of inhaled ether. She sought it out uh, despite concerns from her friends and family about this brand new technique. And um, in a letter, she wrote, quote, I'm very sorry you all thought me so rash and naughty in trying the ether. Henry's faith gave me courage and I had heard such a thing had succeeded abroad. Two other ladies I know have since followed my example successfully and I feel proud to be the pioneer to less suffering for poor weak womankind. So Phoenix is a little tongue in cheek in this letter, but she's, she's thinking about, she's very aware of herself already as a pioneer in the early adoption of, of ether. The Longfellow family surrounded themselves with art. Um, a tremendous art collection remains in the home today. We'll actually have a new deep dive tour every Friday this summer um, just to look at the art collection. They surrounded themselves with music, with thousands and thousands of books, which again, remain in the collection today. Um, Long, uh, Henry and Fanny Longfellow's friends included Charles Sumner, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Cornelius Felton, James Russell Lowell, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Charles Dickens, um, George Washington Green, Louis Agassiz, um, Oliver Wendell Holmes, and many, many others. Um, and in rooms like this, this is the parlor, which I, I failed to describe, but this is um, the Longfellow House parlor. It has very green and busy floral carpet, floral wallpaper, floral drapes, and paintings on the walls. Um, this and in several other rooms of the house, entertaining literary discussion, political discussion would have taken place. And as you see, these beautiful rooms of the house crammed with artwork and Victorian bric-a-brac. Um, Imagine dogs and small children running around everywhere. This is a, a lived-in house. Uh, this slide shows two men, a photograph of two men seated at a small table. On the left is Charles Sumner. On the right is Henry Longfellow, already with his longer hair and beard. Um, so Longfellow was particularly close with the abolitionist lawyer and eventually U.S. Senator Charles Sumner of Boston. Unlike some of um, uh, Longfellow's friends, particularly Sumner, Henry Longfellow, you know, maybe because of his temperament, um, certainly because he was careful of maintaining his broad public appeal, generally did not use his platform as a literary celebrity to speak publicly about important but controversial issues of the day. Um, privately, Longfellow supported the anti-slavery movement and freedom seekers, mostly financially. Uh, he did publish a sort of lukewarm uh, book of poetry speaking against slavery in 1842. Um, 
And privately, he's very eloquently about his anti-slavery sentiments. He wrote to Sumner in 1864, quote, until the black man is put upon the same footing as the white in the recognition of his rights, we shall not succeed. And, when, and what is worse, we shall not deserve success as a nation. And again, he's writing in the context of the Civil War about not only anti-slavery, but this sense of equal rights. Um, and again, sometimes we read these things and we say, why couldn't you have said that in public? But again, he's very, very private um, and, and reticent to use his platform in that way. Um, here you see a bronze colored bust of Henry Longfellow with a beard and academic robe looking down. Figures carved in granite behind him include um, a man in colonial clothing and an angel carrying flowers. These depict different figures from his poems. And this is a, a memorial to Henry Wadsworth Longfellow not far from the house. So in 1861, this close social circle, literary conversation, political conversation, letter writing, kids, family, historic house, um, this sort of sense of domestic happiness is sadly shattered. Um, Henry Longfellow's wife, Fanny Appleton Longfellow, um, died in a household accident in which her dress caught fire. Um, Henry was once again a widower. He continued, of course, to raise their children, the oldest of whom was 18 at the time, the youngest of whom was five years old. Um, and his brother, the Reverend Sam Longfellow, came to the house, lived with the family to help support um, his brother and his nieces and nephews. Henry Longfellow and his children remained quite close um, throughout the rest of their lives. So um, again, Longfellow's legacy, um, he died in 1882, about <clears throat> almost 20 years after Fanny passed away. Um, after she passed away, he eventually began writing poetry again. He also did a major work of translation. He did the first American translation of Dante. Um, and, you know, throughout his career, he helped to sort of imagine, again, these American themes, people, events, crafting a national narrative through poetry. And his reputation as a poet really dropped off in the 20th century, but it's difficult to overstate the, the impact of Longfellow's work from this home on American literary culture. Phrases from his poetry have become so enmeshed in our language that I often hear people quoting Henry Longfellow without them knowing what they're doing. Uh, so any you know, time you hear a reference to those ships passing in the night or footprints in the sands of time, those are Henry Longfellow. And he was thinking um, quite a bit about his uh, legacy and memory during his own lifetime. So I'd like to read to you the last three stanzas from A Psalm of Life, uh, where he wrote, the lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime and departing leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. Footprints that perhaps another sailing over life's solemn main, a forlorn and shipwrecked brother seeing shall take heart again. Let us then be up and doing with a heart for any fate, still achieving, still pursuing, learn to labor and to wait. And um, the Maine Historical Society has a wonderful database of all of Longfellow's poems if you'd like to re-familiarize yourself with Henry Longfellow. But again, in poems like A Song of Life and others published later in his career, um, Longfellow was, was conscious of this sense of legacy, of leaving something behind, um, of how he and others might make contributions for the future. Um, so here on the left, you see three young white women with dark hair um, and late Victorian dresses. And on the right, see a middle-aged white man in the early 20th century reading in front of a bookshelf. So in the late 19th into the 20th century, Longfellow's descendants had key roles in the preservation of the house and the collections. And um, they were actively discussing this question that we posed initially of like who and how and what should be preserved. So Alice Longfellow, who is um, in the center of the photo on the left, uh, was Henry's oldest surviving daughter. And she had a lifelong passion for preserving America's historic landmarks. She was on the board of um, the Society for the Preservation of New England Antiquities, today known as Historic New England, um, as well as the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. And in 1913, along with her siblings, um, they created the Longfellow House Trust, which was designed to preserve the site after the Longfellow children were gone, really with a focus on the stuff belonging to Henry Longfellow, his memory, as well as the memory of George Washington. Uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow Dana, known as Harry Dana, is over here on the right. He was Henry Longfellow's grandson, 
the son of Edith Longfellow all the way over here on the left. Um, and Harry Dana had a sense of family pride, but he also, you know, he was also interested in preserving family legacy. He also had a very academic mindset and set up the archives, um, the archival collections to organize and categorize family papers that we still benefit from today. Um, here is one of my very favorite pictures in our collection on the left. This is Harry Dana in a Cossack style shirt posing next to a towering stack of papers, his mail that was here for him at the house after he returned from a trip to Europe. Um, and on the right, Alice Longfellow uh, as an older woman is seated inside the house in a wicker chair. Uh, Harry and Alice's own lives are captured in, captured in the archives that Harry preserved here and both are really fascinating figures in their own rights. Both of them, so Alice Longfellow lived in this house her entire life. She passed away in 1928. And Harry lived with her in this house for big chunks of time in the early 20th century. And he was the last Longfellow family member to live full time in the home. He died in 1950. So Harry and Alice were very close. Um, thinking about Harry, he was, uh, he was dismissed from a teaching position at Columbia University during World War I for his pacifist views, and at that point he began to live and work in his grandfather's home in Cambridge. Uh, he was also an activist and a gay man who hoped to, helped to make this home a safe gathering place for queer community um, in the first half of the 20th century. And his aunt Alice was more private, but her life also speaks to the experience of a sort of previous generation of queer folks in the upper echelons of New England society. Um, Alice Longfellow maintained um, a nearly 40 year partnership with a woman named Fanny Stone. Um, and so together, Alice and Harry made this place a hub of queer community and also historical preservation community in the early 20th century. Um, Alice was, was educated. She was educated at, at Radcliffe and Newnham College. She traveled the world and she was highly involved in many philanthropic efforts. Um, Harry Dana actually started conversations with the National Park Service in the 1940s about transferring this home for long-term care and stewardship to uh, the people of the United States. Uh, that didn't come to fruition until 1972, 22 years um, after he died. Um, but after Harry's death, uh, Henry Longfellow's letters and manuscripts were transferred to Harvard. Um, so today, one of the greatest strengths of our archival collections at the house, and we consider ourselves very, very lucky to have these, um, are the women's papers that were not considered the cream of the crop in the 1950s, but today we can learn such a tremendous amount from. As we wrap up here, I'd like to just show you um, a couple of sort of highlights from our collection, please go on our website or come in person and dig deeper. Um, we have fine art in the collection. Um, we have a, a, a screenshot here from an Albert Bierstadt painting with a, a sunset over a lake. We have decorative arts and furnishings, including this bronze piece, uh, perhaps an inkwell, a historic library with about 11,000 books, um, domestic items, including textiles, children's drawings, toys, and uh, really incredible Asian art collections, um, predominantly collected by Henry Longfellow's oldest son, Charles Longfellow, uh, throughout his life. And we will be having an upcoming exhibition this summer of our Japanese collections on the site um, with a number of objects, art pieces, textiles um, that were collected in Japan in the 1870s by Charlie. So how does it all connect? <laughs> we're gonna end here. Um, again, we're looking at Henry Longfellow's red and brown study, and I'd like to share a postscript. So we're going back to 1855. At the age of 86 in 1855, Darby Vassell returned to the house on Brattle Street to visit Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. This is an encounter that was recorded in Henry Longfellow's journal. And although Henry gives us no indication of what they discussed, he does tell us that it was a lengthy conversation. This conversation took place in Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's study, the room that had been used 80 years earlier as George Washington's dining room and council chamber. Darby Vassell returned to this room on the site of slavery and emancipation for his family. It was a site where Henry Wadsworth Longfellow had helped to shape American memory through literature and where Darby Vassell, 80 years after he had told George Washington he would not work for free, now claimed his space. 
Again, history helps us make progress towards a more just future, and historic sites offer a special opportunity to grapple with our country's historic injustices. While the names on our sign are Washington and Longfellow, making progress towards this more just society requires understanding the people whose stories had previously been excluded. Um, these stories are deeply interconnected and they extend far beyond 105 Brattle Street. So I encourage you to explore some of these layered histories and their resonances in your own community. Um, again, the uh, National Park Service took over stewardship of this site, uh, transferred from the, the trust in 1972. And today we preserve it as a site for public gathering, for discovery, for celebrating the arts, for digging deeper into the tough um, parts of our history. And in doing so, we really hope to connect both the past and the present and to honor where we've come from. So I'm going to conclude my presentation here. You'll see our site name and website, nps.gov slash Longfellow. I'll stop sharing. I've gone on a bit long. I'm gonna take a peek at the Q&A. Um, I see someone points out, yes, this is a different building from the Longfellow House in Sudbury. We are in Cambridge, just outside of Harvard Square. You may be thinking of Longfellow's Wayside Inn. Um, was, oh, let's see, did evacuation day of the British from Boston really happen on March 17th? It did. The, the comment here from an anonymous attendee says, I thought it was a made up holiday for St. Patrick's Day. I think the city of Boston found a convenient resonance in the historical reality of March 17th being the day that the British evacuated. So it's, it's a little bit of a coincidence. Um, from DL, was Nathan Appleton one of the founders of the city of Lawrence? Yes, um, he was one of the founders of the city of Lowell as well. So he's one of the original city fathers of Lowell. Um, he's heavily invested in Lawrence as well as the Waltham Mills, which predate Lowell a little bit. Um, there are still Appleton Mills, Appleton Street um, in Lowell. Did the Longfellow House personal, how did the Longfellow personal property come to remain in the house? Karen, that's a wonderful question and something that it makes this a pretty unique site. Um, it So the, the contents of this house never left. <laughs> um, the Longfellow tr House Trust that was set up by the Longfellow children in 1913 um, just retained all of the contents of the house as they, they sort of transitioned it from private home to public museum. And that family trust transferred it directly to the National Park Service in 1972, 1973 um, with all of its content. Um, so it's a really remarkably intact collection from the Longfellow period. We don't have much or anything from the previous periods of the house, um, but from the Longfellow period, it's very, very intact. Um, and most of the collection is, is stored within the home as well. Um, Shelley is recommending Matthew Pearl's The Dante Club. Yeah, this is a great um, fiction, I think sort of mystery novel, uh, a, a, a quite fictionalized, but really good read version of um, Longfellow and his social circle. Uh, Kent, why is this home sometimes referred to as the Craigie House? Yes, I've given the Craigies short shrift, but um, they are less prominent, but they were long-term owners of the house between Washington and Longfellow. So um, uh, Andrew and Elizabeth Craigie purchased the house in the early 1790s, um, and it was the widow, Elizabeth Craigie, who was still living here in the 1830s, who started renting rooms to Henry Longfellow, and eventually um, um, father-in-law bought it from her estate. So uh, this was the Vassal, Craigie, Longfellow house are the three sort of like long-term owners of the home. Um, same Craigie as Craigie Street here in Cambridge. Andrew Craigie was, um, he was a real estate speculator. He was the apothecary general of the Continental Army. Um, so uh, an interesting person in his own right, but I, I, I sort of gave him short shrift today. Is there parking at the Longfellow House? Um, yeah, Judy, thanks for asking that question. Um, there is ADA accessible parking only. So if you've got disabled hang tag or plates, you can park on site. Otherwise, we recommend public transportation or walking down from Harvard Square, taking your your, your luck into your hands um, on Brattle or Mount Auburn Street. Karen, thank you for including LGBTQ material. Yes, um, queer history is a, a major interpretive and research priority at the site currently. Um, we have a weekly tour on Sundays at 2.30 coming up uh, as well that highlights the queer history of the site. Um, and so some of the, the staff here have done some really wonderful work on that, and we're looking forward to continuing to dig in and, and expand the interpretation of, of LGBTQ history on site here. 
Um, and finally, relationship between Longfellow and transcendentalists. Um, there's actually a couple of great articles on our website here that you can look at um, about that. Longfellow was friends with the transcendentalists, but he wasn't like one of them. Um, he was he was close with Ralph Waldo Emerson. Um, he had Thoreau had been like had taken his class at Harvard. Um, Longfellow includes certainly some nature themes in his writing, but philosophically he was not like fully aligned with the transcendentalists, although again he hung out and conquered a bunch. He was close with Nathaniel Hawthorne as well, um, and he knew those guys. <laughs> um, he's, he's closely associated with the sort of fireside poets, so James Russell Lowell, Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr., um, Henry Longfellow. Um, will the LGBTQIA tour on Friday be a webinar eventually? That's a great question. It's actually on Sundays. So we do an art tour on Fridays, a slavery and freedom deep dive on Saturdays, a queer history deep dive on Sundays, and a George Washington deep dive on Mondays. This is all on our website. Um, it's a great question. Will it be a webinar? Um, will we that's we'd love to consider that yeah we'll think about it we'd love to do that <laughs> um oh there's more questions in the chat including one about how much was the boston economy dependent on slavery paul that's an that's a, a really important question and a big one and i have two minutes so i'll just say it was quite dependent and intermeshed with slavery a couple of books to recommend include jared ross ross hardesty's um Black Lives, Native Lands, White Worlds. It's a very concise history of slavery in New England. Talks a lot about both the social, cultural, economic entanglements of Boston um, and the, the Atlantic slave economy, um, both trading and um, Boston had an enslaved population of about 12 to 15% in the 18th century. So um, significant representation of the, the population. Right. So All Emily, right. I think uh, I think That's we'll it. have to wrap it here. Great. But folks, if you haven't already, uh, please in the chat indicate if you've enjoyed today's program. Let's give Emily a big virtual round of applause. She did a fantastic job under time constraints. She covered quite a bit of material, so we <laughs> greatly appreciate it. Uh, folks, look for an email from me later today for those watching live uh, with a link to a feedback survey, a link to this recording, and information about some other upcoming uh, virtual programs we have with the uh, Massachusetts National Historic Sites. Uh, the, the one uh, next week I'm uh, particular, particularly looking forward to uh, next Wednesday, March 15th at noon, uh, we're visiting the Boston African American National Historical Site. And they're going to be giving us a virtual tour of the Black Heritage Trail. So that's a week from today, uh, Wednesday, March 15th at noon. Emily, any last words before we wrap it up? No, just thank you so much. I'm going to tune in for that next week. Um, everything we do here is free. So just please come see us. And, and thank you so, so much. It's been All a right. Thank you so much, Emily. And I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Thanks again. Bye-bye. <laughs>